welcome everybody to the BioXL webinar. And today we have a student webinar. In particular, it's the student that won the poster prize for the summer school edition 2023. And the three winners are Daniel Sur, uh, Sursuequa, Eleonora Serra, and Ricardo Scarin. And I'm hosting the webinar. I'm Alessandra Villa from the Royal Institute of Technology. And with me, it's Otto Anderson from the Finnish IT Center for Science. So as you can see, our speaker come from different parts of Europe. Uh, Daniel come from the Heidelberg Institute for Theoretical Study. Eleonora come from the ITT, Institute Italiano of Tecnologia Genova. And also she's working in SECAM Lausanne. And uh, Ricardo also works uh, for a pharma company, Atlas Molecular Pharma SL, and also for a research center, CIC BioNUN Bilbao. So the webinar is recorded, just that you are informed. So during the webinar, you can ask questions to the speaker. So I will ask you to use at one, at two, at three, to address specific Daniel, Eleonora, or Ricardo. Maybe you have a question for everybody, don't put anything. And you have to use the function of Zoom that you find at the bottom of the Zoom application. Depends on which operating system you have, you might see this symbol, or you might have this symbol. Then you just click, and then you type your question. You can type the question whenever you want. At the end of the three presentation, I will unmute you if you have a microphone so you can directly ask your question, or I will read for you the question to the speaker. So something about the speakers of today. So Daniel will speak about how a stretching force differently stabilizes chemical bond on a protein back bond while Enonora will be speaking about bidirectional paths-based non-equilibrium simulation for binding free energy estimation. And finally, Ricardo will speak about development of pharmacology chaperone for the treatment of oh, sorry, tyrosemia type one. So now I will start to give the word to Daniel. So can you see my slides? Perfect. We can hear you and you can see all your presentation. Please go ahead. OK, so today I'm going to talk about my PhD project. And in this project, we try to describe the effect of an external force that uh, uh, pulled a molecule. And then it could destabilize the uh, bonds in the backbone of a peptide. And this is important to study because uh, basically stretch molecules are everywhere in material science. Basically, all materials who load, load any, any external force are submitted to stretching of the molecules. And in particular, in biology, when we moved any muscles, then our tissues are stretched. And that basically means that uh, our uh, the, the molecules inside are also stretched and then understand what happened inside of this stretch molecule could uh, give us uh, some clues of uh, or some to solve some healthy problems and so on. But this is basically the broad uh, problem, but the more specific problem that we have to what we want to address is, uh, which are the most unstable bonds in a molecule that is stretched by an external force. Then to do that, we start assuming that the change of energies when we stretch the molecule, the total change of energy can be decomposed to the change of energy in each one of the degrees of freedoms. So we have here uh, the expression that we are using to do such a decomposition. And then the index i 
correspond to the different degrees of freedom. And when I say uh, degrees of freedom, I refer to distances, angles, and the hydras. Then our model is predicting how the energy is distributed in these degrees of freedoms. And uh, the idea is to do this, uh, so solve this problem using QM approximation. So the level of accuracy of the of DFT, uh, but the Q problem, the key problem is to solve this integral here, uh, where this FI corresponds then to the force in the direction of the degree of freedom and the Q would be the different degrees of freedom, the values corresponding to the degrees of freedom. And uh, then we have this equation and for solving this equation, then we have two options. One of them is called JEDI that uses a harmonic approximation. And in this uh, one, basically we assume that uh, around the minima, we can do an harmonic approximation and uh, have some prediction of the, this distribution of energies. And the other solution that is a solution that we propose is to use this method that we call SIF. And in this one, basically we do small stretching such that we have many intermediate uh, stretch uh, configurations. And uh, for the final uh, distribution of energies, then we do a numerical approximation of the distribution of energies. Finally, we are going to use uh, this method, the SIF method, because if we compare then the, the summatory of the distribution of energies, the summatory of these terms, then it will be equal to the total change of energy. So basically, we can compare uh, the result that we are obtaining from each one of these, the composition method with the uh, total change of energy from DFT. And as you can see here, the SID, the method using SID is way closer to the reference value. And then we are going to use this method to do this description of the distribution of energies. Uh, as an example of uh, the kind of result that we have, then I will going to show the example of three alanine. Uh, this is small peptides with three alanines. And the normal procedure that we do is that we start from the optimized configuration. We optimize the structure using DFT, and uh, we basically increase the distance uh, of the extreme atoms uh, by a value of delta D. And then we constrain the distance, and we re-optimize again using DFT. And then we repeat and repeat the process a number of times until we have different stretching and then we can do the numerical integration that I showed in the previous slide. And the kind of result that we have is uh, something that I show here. Uh, so here I show the, the, the change of the energy or the energy stored in each one of the degrees of freedom respect to uh, the degrees of freedom. Here are all the degrees of freedom. What well, this part then corresponds to the degrees of freedom uh, of distances, this one are, this part here is the degrees of freedom of angles and this one of the dihedrates. And uh, as you can see, then the gradient of colors correspond to the stretching step. And for the non-stretching step, then the energy stored is completely zero. That is what we expect. If we don't stretch the molecule, then there is not any distribution of energy. But then when we start to increase the stretching uh, of the molecule, then we, start to see different distribution of this external energy that is being introduced to the system. And uh, here we can see something like the first or the most meaningful results. That is that the distance is stored most of the energy, while the dihedrals uh, degrees of freedom doesn't store uh, uh, much, much energy. And uh, also we obtain, we continue these stretching steps and step of stretching until we got a rupture. So a rupture means that the distance between two pair of atoms increases a lot and the rest of the molecule got relaxed. And uh, we obtain that the rupture happened always 
in the distance that stores more energy. So basically what we are obtaining is that the, the degree of freedom that stores most of the energy is the most probable to be to, to suffer a change. In the case of distances, that uh, would mean that the distance is storing most of the energy is then uh, is going to suffer the rupture in some point. And uh, we do this kind of analysis, not only for a uh, three alanine, three alanine, as I said before, is just an example of the kind of procedures that we do. But instead of that, we can have a different combination of amino acids. In particular, we are having three order, basically three order amino acids. And to remove the effect of the capping atoms, then we only consider the distribution of energies in the amino acid of the middle. So in this case, if we do different combination, for example, in this one, LKD, then we will have only the distribution or we are going to analyze only the distribution of energies in the K amino acid. And the reason again is to uh, remove the effect of the external uh, of the capping atoms. With this database or this uh, basically this set of different combination of amino acids, then we want to create a machine learning algorithm that predicts the distribution of energy for different stretching steps for different configurations. And then we can apply this method, this analysis method for larger system, because of course, in nature, we are never going to find or not like a very often a, a, such a small amino acid, but we, we a, such a small peptide, but we usually find something like way larger systems like proteins and so. So with the machine learning algorithm, we expect to have a prediction of the distribution of energies for larger system and this case of a mole of proteins and so. Uh, this, uh, the database that I mentioned before is being under construction yet, but uh, still we have some preliminary results. So what I am showing here is that the, the energy stored specifically in the degree of freedom corresponding to the distance between the uh, alpha carbon atom of the backbone and the nitrogen atom of the backbone again, and the alpha carbon and the C uh, atom of the backbone. So as we can see here, uh, basically, the first result that we obtain from the comparison of one and the other is that the uh, C alpha C uh, bond is storing way more energy. That would mean then that this uh, bond is more probable to be broken in comparison with this bond. And uh, another result that is also uh, basically uh, one reason to to uh, or so, so to say, a highlight of, of this uh, result is that for different amino acids, each line is a different configuration, a different set of amino acids. Different amino acids can store different ways uh, the energy in the same bond. That would mean that different configuration, if we have different amino acids, then we will have some specific amino acids that are more probable to be broken. Uh, then what we have is that we implemented um, a method to obtain the distribution of energies uh, in a stretch peptide. In particular, uh, we can predict then with this distribution of energies, which bond will be broken. So for example, in this case, we have for every stretching step, a different distribution of energy and the bonds that is storing most of the energy is the first to be broken or the most probable to be broken. With this information, with this method, then we are creating a data set to train a machine learning algorithm. And in the near future, we expect to have some results with this uh, engine to, to show to the world. <laughs> And uh, yeah, but so far with this analysis, with this data set, we have 
we can conclude that for different configuration of amino acids, different order of amino acids, we have different distribution of energies. And finally, I want to say thanks a lot to the MBM group uh, led by Professor Frauke Greta. That is the group where I'm going my, I, I'm doing my PhD and especially thanks to the BioExcel organizers uh, of the summer school. So yeah, that, that's, is, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now we go on with Eleonora. Please, Eleonora. Uh, Daniel, could you stop sharing? Thank you. Yep. Okay. So, can you see the screen? Perfect, Eleonora. We can hear okay. you and we can see everything. Please Perfect. go ahead. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today I will present my PhD project and that is done in collaboration between IIT and the Second Center. And it is uh, titled uh, Two Directional Path-Based Non-Equilibrium Simulations for Binding Free Energy Estimation. So here I did a little introduction about the central topic of my research. So binding free energy is a central quantity in the drug discovery field because it's able to quantify the strength of interaction between a ligand and the receptor. So considering a protein ligand minute process, the complex between the ligand and the protein is in equilibrium with the free form of the protein and the ligand. And starting from this equilibrium, uh, the Gibbs binding free energy can be computed. This quantity is related to the KD, so the dissociation constant of the complex that can be evaluated experimentally, but it can be also evaluated computationally. And among all the computational tools that can be used, all atoms' molecular dynamics are the most suitable. Uh, in this way, the binding affinities and the um, free energy that can be evaluated from simulations can be used to optimize promising compounds along the drug discovery field. However, uh, evaluating computationally binding free energy poses many challenges, starting from the complexity and the size of the systems that we have to simulate, but also because of the wide range of the time scales of the phenomena, starting from the um, femtosecond for the bond vibration and reaching also the seconds for the protein ligand binding process. For this reason, uh, we cannot use a standard molecular dynamics, but we have to use an ensemble sampling methods because they are able to accelerate their events and to expand the approachable time scale. Uh, an ensemble sampling methods can be divided into different families, method not based on physical path and method based on physical path. Uh, the first family of methods relies on the fact that the free energy is a state function and they follow alchemical transformations they are often used to estimate relative binding free energy. Uh, they are in some way simple to be, to be implemented, but they don't offer uh, any kinetic or binding information. Um, on the other side, the method based on physical path requires the identification of a collective variables. They are used to define the potential of immune force and they reveal kinetic and mechanistic information. However, the definition of the collective variables can be very difficult. And among these two different methods, we decided to use method based on physical path. Then, uh, after the definition of the methods that we use to sample the rare event, we have to define the estimators. And the free energy estimator or binding free energy estimators can be divided into class equilibrium free energy estimators and non equilibrium free energy estimators. In the first family, we can find the free energy perturbation approach or the Bennett acceptance ratio method, while in the second family, we can find the Jorginsky estimator and the Crookes identity. And what we decided to use was to use this kind of estimator. So Jarginsky equality is a simple equality and it's able to relate the work done during a transformation to the free energy of the transformation itself. So in our case, the work done during the unbinding or binding transformation to the free energy. Jarginsky uh, estimator is fairly simple to be implemented, but it can be biased given the limited number of observed work values and exponential average uh, is sensible to our events. For this reason, we, we want to use a two-sided estimator as the Crookes fluctuation theorem because it's known to be more accurate. And here I um, present the Crookes fluctuation theorem. And as we can see, it's simply a relation between the forward and backward uh, distribution of the work values and the intersection point between the two distribution, in our case, uh, the work values for the unbinding and binding event give us the binding free energy. 
So after the definition of the sampling approach and the estimator that we want to use, we have to define a computational pipeline for computing the binding free energy. And what we decided to do was to take a pre-existing pipeline published some years ago in our lab and to improve and modify it. So, uh, in the first step of the pipeline, we use the nonsense sampling methods to generate a preliminary path describing the rare event of interest. So, what we decided to use was adiabatic bias molecular dynamics with an electrostatic like collective variable to describe our unbinding and binding events. Then, among all these preliminary paths, we select one trajectory which bears the smallest simulation time and it is mecha mechanistically sound. And we call it our initial guess path. Uh, the initial guess path was then uh, used in conjunction with two algorithms, the principal path algorithm and the equidistant waypoint algorithm. The first one was able to clean the put put putative minimum free energy path, and it was composed by consecutive conformations capturing the rare event. And then the second one was able to define a minimum free energy path with uniform spacing in terms of Rens T between the consecutive frames. In this way, after this step, we obtain an optimized minimum free energy path describing our unbinding event. Then, in the original pipeline, they decided to use world temperate metadynamics in conjunction with the path collective variables, that is an inherently serial algorithm. But what we decided to do was to use, instead of world temperate metadynamics, steered molecular dynamics to perform simulation about, um, following the path for the unbinding and binding simulation, because we know that steered molecular dynamics is trivially parallel. Then, after the use of steel molecular dynamics and performing multiple replica, we computed the standard binding free energy as a sum of two terms, the binding free energy from simulation and the standard volume correction term, where the binding free energy from simulation was simply computed as a ratio of the partition function. Okay, so here I try to represent what does it mean to use path collective variables. Path collective variables are a, a specific type of collective variables published some years ago by Branduardi and co-workers, and are called S and Z, where S describe the progress of the system along the path, while Z describe the distance from the path itself. So here, uh, try to represent patterns. So after the usage of our algorithms, we define a minimum free energy path and describing our unbinding and binding events. And then by using the path collective variables, we were able to perform steer molecular dynamics for the unbinding and binding events. Okay, so uh, which systems we decided to use? We decided to use three different systems, increasing the complexity and the size of the system. So a simple host gas system as a toy model for fine tuning and validate our pipeline. Then trypsin benzamidine as a benchmark system for free energy strategies. And finally, ABL tyrosine kinase and Gleevec complex because it is an interesting therapeutic system. For CB8G8, we follow the stage of our pipeline. So we fine tune the adiabatic bias molecular dynamics. Then we optimize the minimum free energy path. And then by using the path collective variables, we performed 50 replicas of binding and unbinding events at five different simulation times. So 10, 25, 50, 100, and 100 nanoseconds. Uh, after the um, usage of steered molecular dynamics, we reconstruct the work profile of our transformation. We applied our estimator and we reconstructed the potential of mean force. Uh, to reconstruct the potential of mean force, we applied the estimator for each value of the S variable. And in this way, we obtain a point of the free energy surface along our collective variable, and so a point of the potential of mean force. Uh, I have also to specify the fact that instead of using the simple Crookes fluctuation theorem, we realize that it has the same mathematical formalism of the Bennett acceptance ratio method. And so, what we really implement was the Bennett acceptance ratio method, replacing the work, uh, the um, internal energy with the work values. Okay, so we applied our estimators, as I said, for reconstructing the potential of mean force. And then uh, from the potential of mean force, we had to define a discriminating frame that was able to discriminate between the bound and unbound states. And we did that uh, through a visual inspection and analyze, analyzing our potential of mean force. After the definition of the frame, we were able to integrate our potential of mean force. And finally, we compute the binding free energy as a simple ratio between the partition functions. 
of price. So the first results that we have for uh, CDHG8 uh, are here reported. And what we can see is that uh, considering an experimental binding free energy of minus 13.5 kilocal mol, uh, we had a good agreement between our computed results and experimental data. And increasing the simulation time, the group's fluctuation theorem was able to converge towards the experimental value. Uh, considering our second system, Tripsim and Zamidin, we follow the same stages of the pipeline. So we perform the 50 binding and unbinding replicas. And then considering the results, considering an experimental value of minus 6.2 kilocal mol, we could see that the free energy computed by the Jarginski estimator were an upper and lower limits of the experimental value. While the Crookes Fluctuation theorem had a good accuracy, with a good agreement with experimental value, and we could see a good accuracy and a good convergence feature for the Crookes Fluctuation theorem. Moreover, what we tried to do was also to define um, the sensitivity of the binding free energy with respect to the discriminating frame, and we could see a low sensitivity of the binding free energy with respect to the discriminating frame, the discriminating frame that was used to define the bound and unbound states. So, finally, for a bl Gleevec system that was uh, the most uh, complex one, we did this initial stages of our pipeline, while uh, the 50 replicas of binding and unbinding events are still ongoing. So as a conclusion, we could say that for small and moderated size uh, size protein ligand complexes, we found that the Bennett acceptance ratio estimator coupled with the path collective variables is able to converge. And our approach gives accurate binding free energy values in conjunction with mechanistic information from the path. So the integration of the path collective variables and two directional steer molecular dynamics enables both much faster convergence rates and trivial parallelization of simulations, significantly reducing the overall time required to obtain accurate binding free energy estimates. Finally, for bigger systems having pharmaceutical interest as our ABL tyrosine kinase glive complex, we are now in the process of challenging our approach. So I want to thank uh, my supervisor, my collaborators, and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Eleonora. And now we go further. If you could uh, stop, stop sharing. sharing. Thank you. Yes. And now we have our last speaker. Ricardo, please. Okay, can you hear me? Uh, we hear you a little soft. Okay. Is it better now? Yeah, perfect. And okay. we see, if you can go on full screen, we see your presentation. Yes, sure, one second. Uh, I just, okay. I'll try to share again then. Because... Yeah, sure. Yes. All right. Um, okay. Today I want to speak about the development of a pharmacological chaperone for the treatment of uh, tyrosinemia type one. So, uh, to understand uh, this project, uh, we have to look at the bases that were uh, created in the lab uh, to understand the uh, pathological phenotype of uh, tyrosinemia type 1 and the characterization of uh, the target and the fragment screening that was done. My main contribution was in rational drug design and evolution, but to understand it, let's look at the background. So, and what, what is tyrosinemia type 1? If we look at the catabolism of tyrosine, uh, we see that several enzymes uh, catabolize the final lysis uh, of uh, tyrosine to acet uh, acetate and fumarate. And if uh, this enzyme fail to explain this, this function, we will have different type of accumulation of metabolites that can lead to tyrosinemia type 2 or tyrosinemia type uh, 3. Uh, and the worst one is uh, tyrosinemia type 1, if the last enzyme fail uh, his function. Uh, because these uh, lead to the accumulation of uh, fumaryl uh, acetoacetate and uh, uh, the accumulation of a byproduct that is succinyl acetone. This molecule is highly toxic, is uh, induced hepatocarcinoma, and uh, the people that uh, as uh, these mutations can uh, uh, die in uh, two years old. Uh, luckily, there is a drug that uh, uh, blocks the production of succinic acetone by blocking the catabolize of the tyrosine at the very beginning. 
So in our lab, uh, my colleagues uh, characterized the target that is FAH, for real acetoacetate hydrolase. Uh, this is a, a dimeric, uh, uh, this is dimeric protein of uh, 96 kilo Dalton. And uh, in uh, our lab, uh, my colleagues find that uh, mutation does not uh, impair the catalytic side or uh, uh, better, most of the mutation are destabilizing the dimeric form to the monomeric, in increasing the aggregation, thus uh, taking out from the equation the protein in the cells. In fact, a model mutation that is a uh, glycine uh, 137 to serine, uh, with crispr cas model on hex cell, we see that uh, uh, with this mutation, in Western blood, we don't have any protein. And uh, this is valid also for mice. We have mice model uh, in which we see that the mice after 20 days die in agreement with the phenological uh, pathology um, in the humans. So let's go in the more computational part. We did the fragment screening uh, and uh, um, we like my colleagues identify catalytic side and a dimer interface and they screen a several fragments with docking and uh, the best hits were then screened uh, mainly with the contribution of John Gil Martinez uh, by uh, methyl trosi. And this give an idea of where it is the binding side and uh, uh, which are the best binds. In fact, uh, he could uh, co-crystallize one of these fragments, and that's where uh, we start from the fragment evolution. So by do for doing this fragment evolution, we use uh, a symbiosis between uh, docking, ITC, STD, NMR, and crystal log. So we start by molecular modeling. We look at the catalytic site. We see that uh, the, the substrate, uh, natural substrate, is a polyketo acid, and it coordinate calcium. And uh, our compound is uh, quite different in nature. It's hydrophobic and it binds uh, as a hydrophobic uh, patch, an hydrophobic patch where it uh, does pi pi stacking uh, with the phenylalanine. So we have a crystal structure with a part of the substrate and uh, our fragment. And uh, we characterize uh, the binding by ITC, and it actually confirmed that the binding is uh, mainly in, uh, entropic because uh, uh, we see the delta G contribution, uh, the red part is the uh, entropy of binding is quite high. So we want to create more specific binding. And we do that, we do so by copying nature. So we try to enrich the scaffold by adding carbonyls and moiety that can be, uh, that the, the, the protein develop uh, a taste for uh, during uh, the years of evolution. So uh, what we do, we select some uh, compounds uh, and uh, from the sync database, uh, we screen for uh, compounds that have 20, around 20 atoms, uh, uh, repartition coefficient between two or three. And uh, we select a, a bench of these compounds and dock them and look at the pose to understand if the pose can have a rational meaning. And uh, then we select uh, 10 compounds only. So it's a low budget screening because uh, we, we look for interaction uh, by striking region in the hydrophobic patch and uh, distance in between uh, 9 to 13 Armstrong, uh, like the one that is in between the substrate and our uh, heat fragment. And uh, we select plausible uh, pose. Uh, we buy these 10 compounds and we screen by STD. Uh, luckily, four out of 10 of these compounds shows STD, but still, uh, STD can be displayed at five millimolar KD. So we are not happy. We want to verify that this compound actually improved the binding. We, we did a pit of mapping to see which part of the compound goes inside the pocket. By STD, you can see that um, the carboxylic acid was the one going more inside the, the pocket. So we have a confirmation by ITC that the enthalpic contribution is increasing, the green, uh, uh, the green column. And also the binding is uh, better. The KD is lower, is uh, 120 micromolar. And so we are happy uh, about that. 
and uh, we will keep the same uh, uh, rational design uh, path. And so we reproduce the same exact selection of fragments and docking and uh, the input fragment uh, uh, from the docking, the best pose will be used as an input fragment to search for other similar compounds, that tiny model coefficient uh, 0 0.7. And at the end we select because of uh, we want a low budget screening, other seven compounds that maintain the pi stacking and display the carbonins um, in a in a way that can make sense in the binding pose. Uh, so one of these compounds, we five out of seven display STD, and one of them display a lot of STD effect in an MR. So we tested by uh, IDC, and we actually got uh, to the nanomolar range. Well micromolar nanomolar range uh, and the binding is uh, contribution is uh, more enthalpic than before and uh, in fact uh, this compound mm, we have a recap of uh, the process and we see how did we increase the binding so the, the affinity uh, we lower the kd and we increase the uh, uh, enthalpy of the binding uh, and uh, mm, in, uh, moreover, we see that uh, this was the original crystal structure. Uh, we can uh, soak the compound in the crystal structure and we can see that it fits exactly how was uh, the docking pose, the pi pi stacking with the ferrilanin 141 and the coordination with the carboxylic acid. Um, the crystal structure has a random square deviation from the docking of only 0.55. Uh, Armstrong, so we can say that the docking model predicted the uh, crystal structure. And uh, we are definitely really happy uh, about this because, as you see, there is the electron density and the uh, binding diagram. Uh, the resolution of the crystal structure was 1.2 Armstrong. And uh, we want now to assess if, uh, uh, if uh, this model is working, like the stabilization of the protein. Uh, is real uh, because it can bind, but we don't know if it gives a chaperone effect. So um, we use an experiment that is uh, a dose experiment, diffusion oriented NMR, and in which we uh, look at the um, rotational coefficient of the molecule in solution. So we take the proton in between 0 0.85 ppm to one, and we check uh, how fast they move in solution. So uh, the bigger the rotational coefficient, uh, the smaller is the molecule. So of course, the, the blue one is the mutant. And at 41 degree, we see that the mutant is, uh, is uh, turning faster in solution. So it means that is in uh, the monomeric state, more the population is shift to the monomeric state, but uh, uh, the wild type, is um, uh, through uh, is the violet one is stabilized uh, in a dimeric state because it has a lower rotational coefficient. So uh, when we add the compound to the mutant, the red uh, bar, we see that the population is uh, uh, shifted through a dimeric state. That means that dynamically our compound stabilized uh, the dimeric state. And uh, we can prove the kinetic of this destabilization by doing a aggregation assay, by checking the percentage of fluorescent during time. Uh, and we see that uh, without uh, our compound, the mutant is degrading uh, in a certain rate. But when we add the compound in solution, the decay of the signal is uh, quite slower. So we have 70% more of the signal uh, after four hours in three replicas. And uh, we confirm that as a chaperone effect, at least in vitro. We also did, uh, in collaboration with Gonzalo Group, we did a screen of 2 million compounds in which uh, uh, three compounds were uh, successfully characterized in the lower uh, micromolar range, and two of them uh, were co-crystallized. And uh, the, the future perspective of this uh, study is to uh, find results in vitro and my model that I already show and create a new chemical entity with a good pharmacological property. Um, 
I would like to thank uh, you for your attention and uh, the organizer of BioExcel and also uh, the group in which I am working and uh, uh, is a really big group of uh, 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 metabolism and precision medicine. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Ricardo. Thank you, Melonora. Uh, thank you, Daniel. And now we can open for questions. So there are some questions. Please go on to ask questions in the Q&A. We start with the question that we have, and I will unmute the Antonio. So you can ask the question. I just let me time to pick up the participant list, or maybe Otto can help me. Uh, yeah, so we can. I can allow you to speak, Antonio, if you can ask directly your question. Uh, hello, do you hear me? Yes, if you can speak a little louder, it will be great. Please. Okay, do you hear me? Perfect. Wonderful. Okay, now I was just wondering if um, uh, Leonora could explain again what was um, the past collective variables and how did uh, she define it for in her system? That's the question. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so hi Antonio. Um, path collective variables actually are implemented in Plumed. So what we did was to use our algorithm to define the path that is simply uh, yeah, consecutive frames describing your rare events. So in our case, the unbinding and binding event. And then the path collective variables implemented in Plumed allows, uh, allowed you allows you to um, define the fact that you want to follow this specific path. So S is a, an equation that uh, identifies the distance from, uh, let's say, in simple word, uh, the frame in the path and your this, the, the real uh, position of your system during the simulation. And so you define this distance and you put a wall, a potential that allow you to have uh, to follow the real path. So it's like you are defining a tube and your system will follow the tube. And uh, the same for Z. So S is to follow the distance in this way while Z to uh, minimize the distance in the other direction. But they are simply equation implemented in Plumed and you define a force to keep the system follow your path. I don't know if it was clear. <laughs> okay, so Plume uh, pretty much uh, um, makes the path for you, right? And you, no. it, you define no. the path, and then oh. with Plume, you follow the path by using S and Z. Okay, okay, perfect. Uh, yeah, that, that's all. Thank you for your talk. <laughs> Very Thank interesting. You. Thank you, Antonio. And now we go to Vlad. I will unmute you. Wait, just give me a moment. Yeah, you should be able to speak, please. Uh, hi, um, thanks a lot for this uh, very nice talks. Um, I was wondering uh, uh, from uh, the second talk um, about the uh, influence on the PMFs of several parameters for the SMD simulation. So the spooling speed, for instance, the number of SMD simulations, um, and also if you have a path that is kind of has a large volume, for instance, let's say you have a large channel that is supposed to be sampled, Will that also influence your PMFs and how, how will they influence it? Okay, so thanks, Vlad. Um, regarding the number of simulations, we started with a small number of simulations and of replica for the unbinding and mining event. And then through the, um, we want to reach a convergence point. So we perform bootstrapping and we see when we could have a good number of replicas that allowed us to reach convergence. So yes, of course, the number of replicas influence your results. Also because uh, when you apply, for example, Jardinsky identity, you have an, an average, an ensemble average, so you have an influence. So we get the right number of replicas by performing bootstrapping and by defining the number of replicas that could allow us to reach the convergence of the value. While uh, uh, the second uh, point was the velocity, if I will remember. And uh, yes, the velocity is very important because if you go very fast, for example, during a steel molecular dynamics, you could have uh, a very high, va high value of uh, dissipated work. And this could be a real problem when you are using um, out of equilibrium estimators. So we started with 10 nanosecond simulation, for example, but we had 
a very high value of dissipated work. And for this reason, we decrease the velocity, so we increase the, the time of simulation. So this affects a lot the potential of mean force and also the final free energy. And then, uh, I don't remember the last point, sorry. Yeah, if you, if you have a system where you have a large, a path with a large volume to sample. So if it's not a direct uh, route, but you have uh, a lot of degrees of freedom along, along the pathway. And I was wondering if the methods are applicable for that situation. Um, so in this moment, we are using uh, two path, uh, the two path collective variables and uh, we define, as I told before, a sort of tube. So the volume, uh, doesn't really affect in this way, but it affects in the way that uh, when I, I don't know if I was clear, but when we want to compute uh, in the end the standard binding free energy, we have also to make a, a volume correction. So we define a volume correction term. And uh, to do so, we have to define the sample volume. Maybe I have a, a slide that could be, um, could help. Uh, what I'm saying, wait, because, uh, yes, here, I don't know if you can see it, but when we want to do the correction, the volume correction, uh, we... Uh, could we you, have... sorry, Ele sorry, Leonardo, could you put in full screen so we see Yeah, better. of course. Thank you. Yes, so when we want to perform standard binding free energy, as I told at the beginning, uh, we have to define a standard volume correction term. And here, the volume is uh, very affecting because we want to define the sample volume for the binding and unbinding. And so we use the software that is able to define this this volume and then we put the we did the ratio so in this way the volume could affect because we want to perf to make the ratio of the unbound volume and the v0 that is a standard volume but we did that for computing standard binding free energy so i don't know if this is answering your question or if you want another point maybe i i lost your point i don't know in this way volume affected the, our results for sure. So if you have possible reorientations of the of the ligands, for instance, within that volume. Uh, mm -hmm. Vlad, sorry, could you speak a little I loud? Didn't... Because we oh, couldn't yeah. hear you. Thank you. Yes, sorry. So I was wondering more about the case where, where your ligand would reorient. So you think of a ligand that is more like a tubular shape and goes out, but then during this process, it kind of reorients, right? Because it's possible. So mm -hmm. would, that, would that be kept, would, would that be possible to simulate or you will just drag the ligand in a certain orientation out? Uh, our, during our state molecular dynamics, actually the ligand follow the path thanks to path collective variables. So if there is not a real reorientation along our path, if we put a high force to follow the path, I don't think that during the steel molecular dynamics we could have a big reorientation of the ligand. Okay, because you. the system is forced to follow the initial path, the minimum free energy path. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, so while people maybe think about other questions, we have 10 minutes still. I have a question for Daniel. I was wondering if uh, you have looked on the fact, so you say that you use triplet, three residue, there is, to calculate the value for the middle one. Did you check if you get different values depending on which are the neighboring in your case? Yeah, indeed, that was one of the tests. Uh, I will share my screen again. So, yeah, so for example, in this case, uh, we not only tested the system for three alanines, but for larger systems, not only alanines, but the, as following the, the previous example, then I show here also larger alanine. So this is a five alanine. And uh, this basically, we want to obtain something like the effect of the capped atoms, the capping atoms. And if it's an infinite alanine, then we expect the same distribution for the whole alanines. But uh, as we can see here, the three of the middle, they have the same distribution. But this one, for example, that is closest to the uh, cap, capping atom, then it has a dis different distribution. 
And uh, basically this result uh, concludes at the same for this one. So with this result, we can conclude that these caffeine atoms is only affecting the first one because the rest is basically invariant to the effect of this part here. So yeah, the, this is the limit, something like how far it okay. can Okay, but so that you mean if you have an alanine with between two tryptophan or you have an alanine two, between two phenylalanine, did you expect to have the same, to find the same value for the alanine? Yeah, because because basically we obtained, uh, we, we made the same cal kind of calculation for other systems, not only alanine. Okay, yeah. And we, and we obtained basically the same, that the, the middle uh, is unaffected by this uh, part or whatever we change in here, uh, something like the largest, the largest uh, change could be with the first neighbor, not further than that. Okay, okay, mm -hmm. okay. Thank you very much. And I have also a question for uh, Ricardo. So at the end of your presentation, you speak, you say that uh, you want to do, a, um, I understand that you aim to have a 2 million compound screening. Mm -hmm. Well, what... we, we already did that. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So... But I was wondering how much time do you need for such a screening? Ah, uh, well, this was done from Gonzalo. Uh, uh, we have a cluster. Uh, that has uh, several uh, GPU. Uh, I don't remember exactly uh, if, uh, exactly the capability, but it's quite large. The storage, I think, is uh, one petabyte of storage, and uh, um, the, the GPU, I think, 100 and 150, uh, uh, no, uh, 12 Titan, yes. So in this setting, uh, it was quite fast, one, one week. One week and it was flexible docking, so semi flexible docking. Okay, so it so, was semi flexible docking. You took one uh, week for for uh, two million compounds that are compounds yeah. like the one that you show, so they are still uh, drugs. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, so you no, it was it was actually divided in a, it was divided in a different uh, uh, patch. So you went from 10 to 15, from 15 to 20 atoms, from 20 atoms to 25, 25 to 30. And then okay. every package was run and uh, several times uh, on the base of this crystal structure that uh, I obtained with uh, my best hit. Uh, yes. But okay. at the end, my screening was smaller. My screening was really smaller. I think in total, what this process of reiterative uh, Process in which I look at every pose one by one, because yeah. I the scoring function is no is not giving you really a prediction of the binding or is uh, is uh, uh, um, weighting more the barred surface area than real meaningful connection in the pocket. So I look one by one, and uh, it's, I think I screen three hundred molecules. And uh, in total, from two million. No, no, no. This before the two million. Ah, before that. Okay, okay. Yeah, I thought that's from the two million. You were end up going uh, no. deep things on three hundred. Yeah. No. Uh, okay. With the, the, the two million, uh, in order to to search for the best hits, we of course select some filter based on the previous finding. Uh, okay. Of the, so, but in between uh, fifteen and twenty five uh, atoms. Uh, the molecule that I, uh, I have to crystallize uh, was in the uh, best hundred molecules. Okay. So this tells like look always to the pose because it's the best. Yeah. Of... Yeah. Did you also plan to improve your scoring function? I did. Uh, uh, I did try a different uh, uh, algorithm and different uh, scoring function. So gold uh, out of the Vina. Uh, M uh, MOE plants. Uh, I, uh, at a certain point, I saw like which one was uh, uh, reproducing the crystal structure better, and I used that one. This MOE in this case was uh, doing okay. the job. Okay, but you think it's not an absolute choice? It depends on the system that I understand. Always. From what? It, yes, I, I think the correct approach, because at the end I use it as a tool, I'm not uh, 
Yeah, so no, you didn't develop. Yeah, yeah, I understood. Yeah, yeah. But the correct approach would be to do a benchmark of different, uh, if you have a crystal structure, you do a uh, benchmark and you find uh, which uh, algorithm and scoring function predicts better uh, your pose, your real pose. And then with this algorithm, you use it to find new molecules. Okay, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. So I don't see any other question. If someone has a question, put the raise hand. In the meantime, I will just uh, share my screen and uh, announce the following webinar. If I still have my presentation, just give me a moment as I pick up. Maybe in the meantime, So the next webinar, that the next Bioxcel webinar will be the 14th of November at always uh, three o'clock, but this time not summertime, but winter time. And uh, it will be, we will have uh, Giovanni Bussi from CISA speaking about thermostat and barostat. Okay, so if there are no other further questions, I will, I guess I close this session. And uh, I, I thank you, everybody, both uh, the three speaker and all the attendees, and see you in the next occasion. Bye.